In this episode, we are giving you the insider tips on how to navigate the crazy property market that is going on in 2021. Welcome to Your First Home Buyer Guide, the podcast for first home buyers who want to get it right. I'm Megan and that was Veronica. We're both buyers agents and probably old enough to be your mums. But that's a good thing because between us, we've got over 40 years experience and we are going to share with you bucket loads of stories about avoidable mistakes. Together, we're going to make sure that you get unbiased and real information that you can rely on so you can get where you want to be without missing a step. Now, we've got loads of great tips for you in this episode. And if you'd like more useful tools, head over to the website, homebuyeracademy.com.au. There you'll find free checklists that you can download, a free mini course on how to price a property and our where to buy a workshop for only $39. Priceless stuff, really. Bargain. But before we get into the interesting stuff in this week's episode, here's the boring bit, the disclaimer. You of course know that nothing in this podcast is to be taken as personal advice. We always recommend getting the advice of an expert in their field of expertise. Now we've done our very best to ensure that the content is correct at the time of recording, but things change. So check with the relevant government authority or your advisors to get the most up-to-date information. Twenty twenty was a tumultuous time in the world with the shocking impact of COVID nineteen on all aspects of our lives. You know, we had lockdowns, homeschooling, delayed celebrations, twenty first, eighteenth, year twelve students battling through, and of course, goodbye international travel. COVID has had such a big impact on so many aspects of our lives, including property. So. How do you navigate this crazy and often unpredictable 2021 property market? That's what we aim to help you with today. But before we do, those of you who watch this uh, on video will know that Megan does love to pick an unusual house to sit in front of. Uh, and this week is no different. It it's looks gorgeous. like... It's called the Nautilus and this one was built in Mexico and it is the most colourful, beautiful, whimsical example of a home I've ever seen. I absolutely love it. It's like living in a shell crossed <laughs> with a mosaic. Um, <laughs> it's a bit... I'm not it's saying I want to live there. I just think it's pretty. <laughs> it's very pretty. It's psychedelic. I think I'd prefer to just have it in my garden, like maybe a pod at the back of the garden rather than actually the house <laughs> itself. <laughs> Maybe uh, scaled down version that you put in the garden. Mm, yeah, yep. there you go. Okay, so look at the video, guys. If you if you, <laughs> if you haven't been watching, if you are listening to this, apologies for the visual gags. All right, Megan. When we started planning this episode, I went back to my diary in 2019 to remind mm. me of what the world looked like before COVID. Um, <laughs> and funnily enough, you know, it, it seems like so long ago, and in mm, respects, it? but at the end of 2019 as we're heading into spring and today we're launching this episode on the first day of spring in 2021 but in spring 2019 in Sydney anyway we'd started seeing the fresh spring shoots new shoots of new growth in the property market because we'd come out of a um a downturn of a few years and um and yeah that's such a strong bullish run for so many years and and then that yeah, that, that um, relaxing of interest for a period of time, shall we call it. <laughs> See, Megan is quite scathing at the property market in Sydney. But anyway. I'm we not had... scathing at all. <laughs> <laughs> we had had a boomer run, bumper run, five-year boom mm-hmm. that ended in the middle of 2017 and it sort of ended that then that the downturn came. And, mm-hmm. and in a way, obviously this episode we're talking about how you're going to deal with really planning to buy in spring, in a spring market, in a crazy year where prices are rising everywhere. Now, in, in my entire time, I guess, in property, um, I haven't had a situation where prices have risen everywhere, you know. And yeah. this, is, yeah, this is the case across the country. It's not limited to one market or two markets. It's, it's, there's nothing that's actually, it's almost counterintuitive, that's what I keep saying to people. It is. And so that is unusual, but what mm. isn't unusual is that the market does work in cycles. 
And so what we were experiencing at the end of 2019 was was the beginning of a new cycle, which was we were expecting to go into a growth phase again, right? And then it got sort of a bit interrupted with COVID, then it came back on steroids. But what we had <laughs> what we had been through was a downturn. So there's prices go up, then they go down. They don't go all the way down to the bottom. It doesn't sort of flatline. But mm. uh, you know, so that's what we that's what we were dealing with a couple of years ago. And now it's all different. I get it, it is. It's completely different. And it's really eerie to think about it. I mean, you know, when we look back, we were really foot, footloose, fancy free, had absolutely no idea what was coming. You and I had started planning Home Bar Academy. You know, we had trips <laughs> to Sydney. We'd jump on a plane and go to Melbourne. We had whiteboards. We had research. We were doing oh. interviews with people. We were just gathering, gathering, gathering information. And for the first time in many years, I actually had some plans to take time off from Property Pursuit, my, my business in Brisbane, to travel. And, in fact, oh, did you? in 2020, my plan was to have three weeks overseas, which I actually had not done since 2007. Oh. So that's how long it had been since I'd had more than a week off. Wow. And, you know, the, it was, you know, really it 2020 was going to be the year of me, travel, freedom, you know, all those sorts of things could not have been. Sorry if I caused COVID. Uh, you <laughs> poor bugger. Like, <laughs> At least I've had lots of holidays. Divorce, you know, everything was going on. And anyway, <laughs> we digress. But the property market in Brisbane had been growing pretty steadily at a moderate pace until about January 2020. And that's when demand rose really rapidly and the housing market seemed to really pick up pace here. So for the first time since the last peak in 2014, Brisbane looked really poised to have some seriously strong price growth. So January, February, March, it was really quite crazy here. Demand was high there wasn't a lot of stock and we thought it was crazy at the time but insanity was actually yet to come <laughs> ah because just before easter of course a sledgehammer arrived and we were locked down and at the time Boom. what yeah. we're doing what yeah, we're doing home? Like, oh my god what's going to happen we're all going to fall off a cliff there was lots of doom and gloom around the property market in fact mm. um the our, my other podcast the elephant in the room we actually um went into overdrive and we're releasing two episodes a week, really trying to really get to the bottom, dealing with talking to experts as to what is likely to happen. We were talking to um, people who were expert in the share market, for instance, to say, well, if you tracked back to all the major catastrophes that happened in the last hundred years, you know, like depressions and black mm. Sundays and black Mondays and whatever's and, and, you know, how is the market, that market bounced back? Because there's some clues in there because it's all about human behaviour really. Mm-hmm. Um, and the one thing nearly everybody uh, predicted that the property market was going to fall off a cliff. There were all sorts of panic buying and selling going on. Uh, you know, and it's funny because I, I remember, and I actually do think I said this on the elephant in the room, you know, after lockdown, it could really trigger off a massive boom because people could be or just like over my house. If I've made a mistake or buying this house or if I hate my family or mm. if I hate my husband too or my small, wife. the layout's or, not great. Yeah, or it just doesn't work. And, and, or I don't like the area because I was, you know, limited to 5K from where I live and I hate it. Whatever, the people are just going to come out of the vault out of their boxes at the end of lockdown and go crazy wanting more space. And that's exactly what's happened. And whether that's more space around them and so they've left cities or whether it's more space in the actual house or whatever, it seems to be that space is the most important thing these days. And it's just sent people, I guess you can't go overseas, so we've got to spend our holy holiday budget um, on our homes. There's there's a lot of people that have had a lot more budget to spend on a property upgrade or their first time because they haven't been spending on on other things. And I know a lot of people have worked, you know, really made it quite, quite a conscious ef- effort to um, buy, you know, takeaways and things from local businesses to help mm. support them. Um, and that's a really um, really good thing to do. But a lot of people who may have holidayed overseas or might have spent money on other things, activities, going out, all those sorts of things, that money has actually sat there. Um, ready to be invested in something else and and people have used it in a lot of cases on their next property acquisition. So, you know, it's really interesting what we've seen during this process and I think it helps um, it helps our listeners to understand well, what has kind of driven where we are now, what what, what are the behaviours, who are the people, how have we got to this point, and then what can they do about it and how do they manage that and how do they continue to be really quite astute in the decision-making process of buying their first time or investment 
investment property. So I, I know that in, uh, you know, we have not only a buyer's agency in property pursuit, but we have a property management department as well. And it has been really, really interesting to watch how many investors have either moved back into their investment pr- properties, um, lots of expats returning, and maybe they'd bought their future home, but they weren't planning to come back for five or six years and suddenly bang, they're back in the country. So investors have been selling to either kind of, kind of take advantage of the market uprise, up, up, um, rising in prices mm. or they've moved back into the properties. And, and that's taken quite a bit of the investment stock out of the property market and actually had an impact on renters. Um, and there's kind of this flow on effect that's kind of happening with rents being pushed up and, and then renters themselves saying, well, it's a good time for us to buy because we didn't go overseas. We've got a little bit extra in our pocket to to um, contribute to a deposit so it's almost like this big cycle of of things coming and going in the rental market that's impacting the the property market itself too and then you've got you know many many places where it's cheaper to buy than it is to rent as yeah, rents big rise out around that at the moment too yeah because the interest rates are so low and rent and, and rents are rising in many areas except for um sydney and melbourne apartments in, in a city if you want cheap rent that's where you gotta go <laughs> um, oh well it's it's, um, it's anywhere really brisbane <laughs> sydney melbourne yeah. it's still oversupplied and there's still a lot of supply to come on too and do you know there's a really really good solid lesson for all first home buyers in that in, in itself in that we are talking about booming conditions for rental we we're talking about booming conditions for selling and yet there are still some properties struggling to rent and struggling to sell and do mm-hmm. not be tempted to buy those properties that are easy to buy <laughs> because, because they are time hard to sell. Because that's Academy, <laughs> yep, <laughs> home buying principle number four, if it's easy to buy, it's difficult to sell. So mm. if it's easy to buy in a rapidly rising market where there's a huge amount of um, demand and competition. If it's easy to buy, then in any other market, it's going to be difficult to sell. Yes. So don't be tempted. One of the things that happens typically in the spring in, in the Australian market is that more stock comes on to the market. And so what you have, and it does, it does, it's more pronounced in the colder climates than it is mm-hmm. in the warmer climates, but, but it's still does you finally does open your doors and you step out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Sydney's sort of like in the middle, it's a bit more temperate, but certainly in Melbourne, typically uh, they would have a lot less listings in winter than they would in the rest of the year. And mm-hmm. certainly in Sydney, there are less, but not uh, as many less, but spring, it's touted as spring is selling season and mm. it's really really quite silly from an owner's point of view who wants to put their property on the market because the reality is that that's the very time when mo- more people are putting their property on the market so you get less competition for your property from buyers. Um, but from a buyer's point of view, typically spring is a very good time to buy because there is more stock on the market. And, mm. of course, you know, if we're coming out of lockdowns in various guises across various cities uh, this spring, let's assume we're not still in lockdown, you know, we've got other pent up demand that has held back stock from being listed through the colder months. And so we can expect to see a lot more available to buy. But that doesn't or it's not always a good thing. And because even when there's more stock on the market, quite often what buyers will do is that they will lose their sense of urgency because they will say, oh, great, they'll, they'll take a sigh of relief and they'll say, oh, good, I don't have to rush. Now, we would never say you need to rush anyway, but if you find the right property, it's the time to act. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, and, and taking your foot off the accelerator is not the thing to do just because there's not more properties to, to choose from. Mm. Um, you know, this this is sometimes you can be really, really picky and discerning and look for that needle in a haystack. But in a rapidly rising market, it is not the time to be looking for every box to be ticked. It's about finding the right set of compromises, things that can be overcome, can be fixed, can be updated, can be improved um, and and not continuing to wait. Because if you wait for the needle in the haystack, it'll be three years down the track and you'll be paying 20 or 30% more than you would have done yesterday. Uh, So it's really important to not not proceed with haste. Um, what is it? More less speed, more haste. Maybe that's what it is. Less speed, more haste. Um, so continue to move forward at a at a good pace, but 
but really well done. The other thing that we've seen, Veronica, is um, with so many incentives around uh, for first home buyers, these these grants, and we, we, there's, there are some previous episodes, we talk about some blogs that we've got and certainly harp on about it in the course, and that is that incentives and grants are aimed at stimulating the construction industry. And we just talked before about finding the right property um, and not rushing out and buying something because it's easy to buy because there's so many of it, there's no scarcity around it. And, and that's something that we want to make sure that people are really aware of just because there's an incentive or something kind of um, giving you some money to to make a decision on something doesn't make it a good property decision. That very short-term gain that you might make from getting a, a grant or an incentive is going to be long gone by the time you go to sell that property and realise you may have made a loss or not made anywhere near the kind of gain that you might might have made if you actually made a better decision up front. So it, it's the first home buyer grants. We're very cautious about people still making sure they make really good decisions about the property, the position, the location, um, the attributes of it, the scarcity, the the future owner occupier appeal, all those things that um, make a property an A grade property versus uh, a just can buy it anywhere, anytime kind of property that no one's going to want down the track. I think a good rule of thumb to consider when you're looking at uh, government government incentives to buy property is is it contingent on you having to buy a certain type of property? Mm. And if that's the case, then, you know, be very, very careful because if it limits you to buying a certain type of property or even under a certain price range, if you can Mm. afford more, then you are very much in danger in trying to, you know, fit a square peg in a round hole in order to get that free money. But then after a period of time, you realise it wasn't free money at all. It seemed like (laughs) it. It cost you a lot more. But, yeah, it cost you a hell of a lot more Mm. than you got. Yeah. Um, We've also seen a huge influx of um, very new and experienced buyers, agents and property advisors during this period of time. I know. Um, Whether whether they've sort of changed industries because there was a downturn in whatever industry they're involved with or they're at home, they love looking at property, everybody... Not everybody loves looking at property. A large (laughs) number of people are property tragics who love looking at property. And when you're kind of at home, you start doing it more and think, I can do this for other people. Um, So we've seen quite a blowout in the number of, um, you know, very new entrants uh, coming from a variety of different industries. Um, And you just got to be really careful about that. Yeah, it's a bit alarming actually because, you know, the minute someone says to me, oh, I became a buyer's agent because I really love property and I think, oh, God, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's not what it's about really. You know what, if you did out your first home buyer guide course, you'll actually know more than some of these buyer's agents, sadly enough. So we've got an episode, if, a couple of episodes ago, all about how to choose a good buyer's agent and the questions to ask. So if you're thinking about, you know what, I just need help here, listen yeah. to that episode and that, that will help you avoid these, these inexperienced ones. But yeah, because this is the thing, rising markets cover a whole bunch of surprises, uh, uh, um, mistakes. They smooth things over and you won't even know you've made mistakes until down the track. Yeah. And that's the problem. No one's fearful in a rising market of making a mistake in the same way they are in a falling market in a falling more market fearful of not getting in yeah that's exactly mm. it. So they'll, they'll make all mm. sorts of mistakes to get in and then it's afterwards that they actually realize oh god i got stuck with something so you've got to be very very careful in a hot market which is what one thing that we want you to be aware of coming into spring 2021 we expect yes there's going to be a lot more stock on the market you've got to be careful because it is has been a hot market a rising market there's a lot of people a lot of opinions not just the inexperienced advisors and buyers agents out there so you've got to sort of take your time to recognize the big picture and and consider the big picture with what you're doing yeah so true so true and in fact in all aspects whether it's a mortgage broker or financial advisor or whoever is part of your support team we talk about the support team as part of the very very first step in the pace system in your first home buyer guide and that's assembling your support crew so it it it, it, you need to look for the depth of experience with Mm. in your area and within you know what it is that you're trying to do um Lack of rental properties is is a big one that we've seen. So these are all observations of what we're seeing in the current market. Uh, panicked panicked tenants, uh, multiple applications on houses and, and townhouses, not so much on units, uh, and weekly rents actually being pushed up by the tenants themselves. So there's a bit in the media um, around 
landlords pushing up rents. In fact, what we're seeing, our experience is that tenants themselves are the ones that are pushing up rents because, you know, they're, they're really quite panicked about the fact that maybe their owner has sold the property and they need to get into something and they're concerned or they've got a deadline. So that, that's really an observation that we're seeing. And there are so many opportunities for those that are considering considering rent vesting or adding an investment property mm. to their portfolio um, that really make this an interesting time to talk to a financial advisor about your bigger picture about whether adding an investment property to your portfolio um, is a good one at the moment because I think this is the first time in many, 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 many years that we have seen rents go up in Brisbane. So we've, we've seen them fairly stagnant for a long time. And I know that in just about every other location where we talk to buyers agents, experienced buyers agents around the country, they're experiencing the same sort of thing with rental demand. And it is just, it is just really hard for tenants to get properties and they are pushing up the rents themselves. Hmm. Right. Well, you and I, we're professionals of over 20 years experience and, and obviously local knowledge in our patches. Um, so what can we share with our, list, our listeners about what we're doing and what we not just in this insanely fast moving market, but whenever we are dealing with a, with a hot market? Because as I said before, these are cycles. We've been through them before. Mm, different now and it is different behavior now it's it's as I said before it's almost sort of sounds counterintuitive but it has never been more important to focus on a quality Mm. asset never 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 has it been more important because this is almost Australia-wide this behavior of um, fear of missing out It, it we haven't seen it across the country. We've seen it in pockets, in capital cities, in regional markets, in mining towns at different times. But I don't recall, and, and certainly all of the um, the analysts that I speak to don't recall a time where the whole country seems to almost in total be going the same direction, which, it, which is just... It, it, it does my head in it really does, but <laughs> it is what it is. So that's what we have to, you know, that's how we have to... Um, put ourselves out there and and make sure that we understand and act in a really prudent sort of way. So focusing on the quality of the asset has never been more important uh, because it is it is that, you know, we talked about home buy principle number four, which is if it's easy to buy in a bullish market, it's going to be really hard to sell mm. in any other market. Any other market, it's going to be really hard to sell. Main roads, any kind of flooding, backing onto train lines, too close to commercial or shops, you know, in, in high density areas where there's lack of character. These are all things that um, may not, may indicate that it's not an A-grade asset. So that, I think, is the biggest thing that you need to focus on right now pricing of course is important too Mm. I think one of the issues and it's not just in property it applies in everything in life that if you've actually never been through it you can't imagine it and Mm. if you've never actually experienced a downturn when when you can't sell a property you you just can't imagine when you look around you now and everything's flying out the door for crazy prices you just cannot (laughs) imagine a time when that is not happening and and I guess that's the benefit what we (laughs) what we bring to the table with all of our experience to keep hammering that home we are not being negative doom and gloomers this will turn around and when it does that's practical that's it you got to be you got to be you know, left holding a really good asset that will sell. It doesn't matter what the market's doing, but the pricing is really important. So if you haven't actually downloaded our free mini course on how to price a property, then do Mm -hmm. so because this is your best weapon to actually know what property is worth, to have done your research, to have really, really assessed that value of that property. And you still probably have to put a bit of a premium on it in order to buy in a rising market. But if you are very well educated there, you're not going to panic and overpay or you're not going to freak out and and not pay enough you know and and always miss out as important at the moment too because sometimes the ones that you miss out on are the ones that you should have bought um had you pushed yourself a little bit but it has to be for an a-grade asset not for a not for a subgrade um now it just in terms of that course of course we recorded that a little while ago so actual close monitoring of sales is more important than ever. Mm. And, and and it's not, we talk about sales in the last six months within about a 500 metre rate of one kilometre radius of the property in the course. <laughs> it's actually much tighter than that right now because prices are moving so quickly. So it, it's, it, you know, go to every auction in the area that you're looking to buy and find out every sale price. Use the spreadsheet in the mini course to monitor price movements. 
At the moment, no older than four weeks. If you can get enough data to do some analysis on properties that have sold in the last four weeks, even preferably two weeks at the moment. <laughs> so auction results, it's you know really big in Sydney and Melbourne, not so much in Brisbane. So it's actually talking to agents and getting information about properties that have gone under contract that are unconditional that will give you some reliable data that you don't have to wait three months to register on, mm-hmm. on the portals. Let me tell you what I do in my business in Sydney, right? So what we do, we actually index. So when we do our pricing research, which is really, it's it's obviously much more elaborate than our mini course that we get you, teach you how to do. I mean, we're a bit more detailed than that. However, the principle is exactly the same. And what we do, because when you've got a lot of property that's all exactly the same, and if it's selling quite quickly, then you can you can compare an apple with an apple. But if you've got an mm-hmm. apple that you're comparing with a pear or a banana, um, <laughs> you know, they, they might have sold yesterday, but it's mm-hmm. so different. It's not quite comparable enough to the property you're looking at. But another one did sell and it was three months ago, and that's very similar to the one you're looking at. You do have to factor to adjust the prices because of price movement. And that's really very telling. And we use data from CoreLogic to do that. And like, for instance, in Sydney, we're recording this in August for release in September. And by the end of July, Sydney house price has gone up 21% since January, 21. And so there's different amounts per month. You know, the months will vary, but one month, I think it's highest was like 3% in a month. Mm, mm. And so when that compounds, the beauty of compounding is a wonderful, wonderful, magical thing when it comes to buying a property and investing over time. But and when, holding over the long term. Yep. Yes. But when you're waiting to buy and you're wanting to make sure that you buy the right property and, and all that sort of stuff, or you just miss out on something because you're not pricing it properly, you've got to adjust these sales for the growth that's happened between when that's sold and when you buy. It sounds all very complicated, but if you don't really wrap your head around it, you're going to get caught out. Mm. Yeah, so true. And and the last thing you want to do is throw a dart at the dartboard and <gasps> no. uh, just say, well, I've got this much to spend, so I'll throw it all at that particular mm. property because if that ends up being an over a significant overpayment, then you've got a lot of years to make up that uh, that potential for capital growth. Again, assuming you buy an asset that's going to cap to, to grow in that kind of way. Um, you know, it's it's really hard. There are a lot of properties that go to auction in Sydney and Melbourne, not so much in other locations. So one of the things that with non-auction properties or private treaties, um, and this is just a tip that we want to share, particularly in my business where most of what we purchase is, is a private treaty, uh, that it's really risky to make unconditional offers, but agents are really, really pushing for unconditional offers at the moment. And what that means is that you have to have done all all of your due diligence, all of your building and pest inspections, any kind of strata or body corporate record inspections. Um, your bank has to be comfortable with the property as security and have done a, a valuation or given you an indication or you can provide evidence of, of what it's worth. Um, so if you're going to make an unconditional offer and waive a cooling off period, that's an unusual situation in a private treaty. But unfortunately, at the moment in some of these markets, you have to really think about whether that's a possibility or not and weigh up the risks against the, the negativity of missing out continuously because other people are prepared to make those risks. Now, we're not advocating taking those sorts of risks. We're simply saying that you need to think about this before you put an offer in on a property. I don't know how many times we've been in multiple offers with 11, 12, 13 other buyers and had an agent come back to us and say, I've got a completely unconditional offer. It's less money than what you've got. You know, can you make yours unconditional? And in most cases, we're going to protect our buyers in some way, shape or other. You know, there is going to be some sort of format that we're going to put on there but we can often get things across the line with other kinds of conditions. So thinking about your conditions in a a multiple offer situation and what you might be able to do to meet the owner's situation, we've got a few across the line because we've been able to rent back to the owners while they look to buy. And it's it's a powerful situation if someone hadn't bought yet. Um, But, you know, private treaty negotiations are moving at lightning speed, Veronica. They go on Mm. the internet one day. They've got offers on the table, sometimes sight unseen and unconditional the next day and you have to be able to act immediately but you need to be able to protect yourself so there's a lot to think about before you get to the point of making the offer what can you remove as a condition what 
like you can't you remove it as a condition and if you remove conditions or don't have any conditions on your contract what are your risks what's the exposure you know financially can you cover if there's something that comes up um, after you buy a property and you haven't done a building and pest inspection for example you know these are all really really important things to think about before you're in the emotional situation of an agent putting pressure on you to remove conditions or to remove cooling off periods from a, a, a private treaty auction and it's so difficult because, of course, the temptation is to throw your hands up in the air and say, God, that's just what I have to do in order just to buy it. something. Yeah. <laughs> but you don't. You might not realise the impact of that for, for two or three years. Oh, you might realise it straight away in the next rainstorm <laughs> and your roof's leaking and you think, oh, my God, I need a $20,000 roof. I had no idea. You know, yeah. there, there's, there are ways you can go about it. And, in fact, that's something that we do teach in the course is the whole due diligence process and how you can even do a lot of it before you even inspect the property if you're really confident mm. it's going to be the right one. You can actually mm. get yourself way more ready than other buyers. And even though, yes, they might move quickly because they're panicked and they're going to do it unconditionally, mm. you're you're not really doing it unconditionally because you have actually done the research and actually made sure that you have, are well armed, and that's powerful because yeah, uh, it, it's not worth the risk in waiving your your rights if you haven't fully checked these because honestly mm. the opportunities for things to go wrong and this is the thing that people don't really focus on because they're too worried about just getting on the ladder mm. but if you get on the ladder and your rungs been eaten out by termites you're gonna fall <laughs> off that ladder you're gonna be a bit lower down the ladder than you, you originally thought you were going to so yeah well, if the bank doesn't value it at the price that you pay so mm. if you haven't done your pricing research properly and you make an unconditional offer that's not not subject to finance approval and the bank comes back and says mm -mm, you've paid way overs here then somehow you've got to find that extra money to make up between what they'll lend you and what you've paid for the property so unless you've got fairly deep pockets or bank of mum and dad available then you know you really need to think about these things prior to making the offer if you've thought about them and that is within your risk profile and you have got some contingencies to deal with it great you are in a powerful position yeah and look that's one of the things that is so important about the course you know the pace system getting everything done in the right order, order. and I think back to <laughs> when I bought my first house it's a long time ago it's before I know what I know now right um, I had an apartment a little apartment a little tiny apartment I think I've told this story before in earlier podcasts mm. I won't go into it again it was ridiculously small, so so small, in fact, I outgrew it far too quickly. So you can hear mistake, mistake, mistake. So, you know, we're not perfect here. We have made these mistakes before we knew better. And then, Yes, absolutely. We are just a collection of our experiences. <laughs> yes. And, now, and then I went uh, with my ex and we went to buy a house. And I knew I had to sell the apartment. But what I didn't know, because I was given advice by a broker who wasn't as good as we would recommend you get, and I was mm. given advice from the broker that didn't take into account the fact that the apartment that I had was less than 50 square metres. And it, I, when I first bought it, there was no 50 square metre rule in that the banks would happily lend me the money for it. But then by the time I went to sell it five years later, the rules had changed and they would allow, if that was bigger than 50 square metres based on the figures, based on all the numbers and the rent I was getting for it, et cetera, et cetera, I would be allowed to keep it. But because it was less than 50 square metres, the bank said, no, you can't. You mm. have to sell it. They wouldn't actually let us settle on the house until I sold the apartment. And I mm, had exchanged tough. contracts with a what deadline. A mm. And all of a sudden I'm in a world of panic and pain. Now my ex's parents bailed us out in the short term and I did sell it and we got the money and it was fine. But that was something that I hadn't anticipated. Mm. And, and so, you know, there's a number of mistakes. And so it really is about getting the advice in the right order. I got the advice yeah. in completely the wrong order. <laughs> You didn't know what you didn't know. Panic. And that's the whole thing, right? I mean, that's the basis of what we put our heads together to do. You don't know what you don't know. Yeah. Um, but but over time you sort of pick up that knowledge. Look, so if you oh. so I think that the moral of that whole story and everything we're saying here is really that if you are well prepared, 
right? Mm. So today is the 1st of September. If you're listening to this the day it's released, it's the 1st of September. It's the first day of spring, right? Now, if you're not already prepared, go and get prepared quickly. You know, it's so important to be prepared before you really get out there and get active and um, making sure that you you uh, you know what it is you're looking for. You know what your financial situation is. Mm. You know who your support crew is going to mm. be. You know where you're going to get the advice from, when you need the advice. And if you don't know the, all this stuff, then get buy the course because that's Sort's where you will learn it. <laughs> yeah. so, so, because when you are prepared, you will recognize a good opportunity and you'll know yeah. how to go about pouncing and getting it. Or you'll have the confidence to walk away, let it go if it is mm-hmm. getting crazy. Yeah. Yeah. If it's outside. I think the other thing I want to just touch on, um, Veronica, is uh, the amount of properties that are selling before auction. Mm. So they may may have an auction campaign in place. They may have an auction date set, uh, but buyers are throwing themselves at um, at properties and saying, look, take it now or I'm walking away. And, and when there's multiple offers on a property prior to an auction, particularly in the first couple of weeks, if an owner is tempted by that, what you don't want to do is listen to those people who say, play your cards close to your chest. Don't let the agent know that you're interested. Do not do that in this market. That is bad advice. It is old advice. And it is from people who may have thought that they could outwit somebody else. This is not an outwitting kind of market. Mm. The agent is the sole person who has the conversation with the owner. And if they've got offers, you need to have expressed your interest strongly enough to the agent in a way that doesn't necessarily reveal your position, but certainly shows that you're interested. If the owner is going to take an offer, you want that agent to come back to you. You want them to come back and say, look, I know you're interested and you were, you know, getting yourself prepared for the auction. Looks like it's going to sell. You must receive that phone call if you're interested in a property. If you are, you know, a bit offhanded with the agent or rude or not interested or just say, oh, no, it's not what we're, not what we're looking for. It seems overpriced or anything like that. They're not going to ring you because they've got so many other buyers to get <laughs> back to. You are going to miss the opportunity. You have to be in there and show your interest at this point in the market to make sure that the agent comes back to you and says, this looks like it's going to sell. And this is not the market to say, yeah, I think you're pulling my leg. I don't know if you're telling me the truth because it's probably true. There are so many other buyers out there that they probably do have the offers. Now that's not all the time and and the market will change. It'll cycle around again, but that is how you need to behave and how you have to interact with agents at the moment. They must know that you're interested if you're interested. You can always say no, but you can't go back to them and say, I wish you had come back to me if they sell it to someone else. It's so true. And and quite often, um, you know, you hear people come up with certain ideas like, oh, I'm going to make my offer and give them a deadline. I'm going to tell them I won't go to auction. And and it's like the agent's like, cool, so what, mate? Like I don't care because <laughs> I'm going to sell it to someone else. Like, <laughs> you know, you are not important to me. There will The tide will turn. You will become important to them. But right now. Absolutely. But it's not now. It's like a seller's market, not a buyer's market. And I'm giving you tips for right now. <laughs> that's it, right now. This is not always the case. But for now, and, and what Megan is saying is just basically don't play games with the mm. agent. Mm. You know, this is not the t- in fact, never play games with the agent. It's like never kid a kid. The, the agent basically will run, run rings about most people because they do this day in, day out, and you don't. Okay, and job. it's also not mm. their money, but it is yours. So you're a lot more emotional about it than an agent will be. So be upfront about your interest 100%. 100% agree. Mm. The other thing about pre-auction offers and what I've noticed certainly in Sydney is that now quite often because there's so much interest the agent won't field a pre-auction offer they'll just simply pull the auction forward. Now this has only happened in recent years and certainly mm. never happened when I was a sales mm. agent. So like, okay, mm. we're not going to have it on Saturday week now. We're going to have it on Wednesday night. Yep. Um it's even happening in the online space now. You know, they just pull the auction mm-hmm. forward. They find an auctioneer yeah. and schedule it. In I think in Victoria, they they sort of called these boardroom auctions. It's probably happened more in Melbourne in in the past than certainly elsewhere. And yeah. so sometimes, if you're trying to buy a property pre-auction, you you can't do it. Like they won't let you. They'll either not just tell you, no, we're not accepting offers prior, or they'll yeah. actually manage to hold an auction anyway. So yeah. you certainly. In, in that time when you're talking to agents, just be upfront with them about your interest, but also say to them, what's your offer process? You mm. know, what do I have to do? How are you going to handle this? Mm. If I do make an offer, what will happen from that point forward? 
uh, it, it, it's, a, it's, it's information and every agent's different. They're not going to handle, even agents within the same agency are yeah. really different on how they're going to handle things. And it depends what the owner's instructions are too. So each owner is different. You can go, you can have an owner who puts their property on the market today who hasn't found anything. If they find something on Wednesday, their <laughs> motivation could change significantly in that yes. time. So that, that every, that turns everything upside down. Then they want speed and they want, you know, all of that to happen really quickly. So you you need to stay close enough to the agent that you're getting a, a reasonable picture and it can change. It's not necessarily that the agent's lying to them. It may just be that the situation changes so rapidly that they're going to change their process to fit in with it. But if you haven't expressed your interest, you'll never know. There is no doubt that we are in unprecedented times, but many mm. people are still buying their first home, upgrading and buying investment properties that's just ticking over and the market's continuing mm. along. And so you can't step out of it if you're ready to buy. What we want to ensure is that in the rush to buy, you don't miss a step or buy the wrong property that ends up being a noose around your neck for many years to come. So true. In this episode, we've covered a very small part of our 10-step online course for first-time buyers. If you would like to learn more about the process and how to buy without making a mistake, then head over to our website, www.homebuyeracademy.com.au. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you won't miss an episode. And if you like what you've heard today, please give us an iTunes review. Five stars would be wonderful. It will help others find us as well. Thank you for joining us. We hope you found this really useful. And if you have, please share the love with others who you know are in the same boat. We'll be back next week with some more priceless stuff. Music.